Can I ask you the same question, Jennifer? Because I won't be running for 40 minutes. I don't have problems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just so that, if you, you know, 10, 15 minutes about the museum, whatever you want to do. Maybe five. Five? I'll see. <laughs> the video will explain a lot about the, about the museum. Yeah. Wonderful. So if people are just coming in, you're on mute already. We just ask that you keep yourself on mute so that we don't, uh, oh, sorry, Khan, I accidentally put you on mute. Um, that we keep you, uh, you, you keep yourselves on mute just so we don't have any background noises coming in. People will be joining us. And Joe, I made you co-host, so if you can keep letting people in as well. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna get started with uh, in a couple of just opening remarks and announcements. We wanna welcome everyone. This is really exciting. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, presentation about the RMS Lusitania. This event is also uh, in part a fundraiser for the new Lusitania Museum that the Old Head Signal Tower Committee in Kinsale is in the process of building, which will be a place to house artifacts, information about the wreck, and to really carry on the memory of RMS Lusitania and everyone who, who this magnificent shipwreck really touches. Um, for those of you who don't know us, my name is Jen Saletti. I'm with DV Tenacious, Joe Masrani. Um, is with DB Tenacious as well. And I guess to kick things off, we should announce that um, we are part of an August 2021 planned expedition to the Lusitania. It's going to be uh, British and American divers coming together to dive the Lusitania, COVID gods willing, in August. And we have decided to sort of dedicate this expedition to raising both funds and awareness of this new museum and the importance of the new museum. And what does that mean for all of you? It means that from now until August, we are going to be bringing you events like this. We're gonna be bringing you updates. We're also going to be doing a live broadcast from Ireland in the middle of our expedition to share what's going on with you live from the ground. So we're really bringing you on this expedition with us. And we hope that you will be willing to um, contribute some funds towards the, the Lusitania Museum as part of this effort. Um, I do wanna say a quick word about the, the fundraiser itself. So I'm gonna be posting in the chat, the fundraiser and the information on the GoFundMe page. There's a couple of things about this. Number one, if you do donate, don't tip GoFundMe. They make enough. We want to make sure all the proceeds go to the Lusitania Museum so you can set the tip to zero for GoFundMe. Number two, if you are in Europe, if you are in Asia, if you pay in anything other than American dollars, do not fear because if you donate to the fundraiser, none of the funds will be converted until the old head signal tower committee withdraws the funds, which means we're not going to be doing a conversion from pounds into dollars back to pounds again. And that brings me to another point in that the only the old head signal tower committee will be able to withdraw the funds from this account. So they're not going through us. They'll be going directly to them. Last, but I think most exciting, we're doing a drawing today for um, a, a GoPro Hero 9 Black uh, that we purchased from Backscatter Underwater Dive and Photography. This retails for over $500 and we're gonna be giving it away after the presentation this evening. So anyone who donates to the Lusitania fundraiser from now until the end of this event will be entered in the drawing to win. If you donate more than $100, you get two entries. And you can see my hat. Here's my hat. It's already filling up with the names of people who have donated. And if you're wondering how much to donate, we thought a great idea for tonight would be if everybody could donate $20.21 for 2021. There are 150 of you interested in this presentation tonight or going that we expect in this presentation tonight. If everybody donated $20.21, tonight we could raise more than $3,000 for the Lusitania Museum. So I'm gonna put that information in the chat, ask that you take a moment to donate. Owen won't mind if you don't pay attention to him for a second while you go donate a little bit of cash. Um, and if you have any questions for Owen, either in the presentation or out in Facebook land, 
please feel free to type them in the chat and we'll make sure we get to all your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Owen McGarry. Owen is a, a diver based out of Ireland. He is, he is a steward, really, of the wreck of the RMS Lusitania and has dived the wreck, I think, more than anyone alive. He has that tremendous distinction. So he is going to share um, a bit about the Lusitania with you. And then we're going to hear from Con Hayes from the Old Head Signal Tower Committee a little bit more about the new museum. So take it away, Owen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you very much for it. And to Joe for even asking me to do this. And uh, something I would just like to point out is that you put a post up earlier in the week about me being a legend. I'm far from that. I'm just somebody who got involved with the Lusitania and a, a lot of Greg's passion and tenacity has rubbed off on me down through the years, but I hope you'll enjoy this. Um, I've been diving off the south coast of Ireland. I suppose it's, you know, because of the world wars that happened, it's a mecca for, for diving. There's hundreds, thousands of wrecks north and off the north and south coast. And because the Lusitania was only 50 miles up the road from me, I said, yeah, it's something I want to do. So it was about 15, 18 years ago, I... I the old style, I wrote a letter to Greg, I got his, I got his um, postal address and he kindly wrote back to me, granting me permission. And it's like, it's almost like the rest is history. And I remember on that first dive that I did it, I thought I was only going to do it once. But I, I was struck by the sheer size of, of the wreck. And it, it just, it gripped me there and then and I just said I had to come back. And ever since, it built from there. Greg gave me jobs to do because I was more of a hands-on type of a diver than a, a sightseer or a tourist type of a guy. So then I, I got more and more interested. And as that happened, I learned the history of both Greg and of the Lusitania. Our friendship grew and it just spiraled from there. And, you know, as Greg would always say, the, the Lusitania will sell itself. But now as he's gone, we have a job to do in ourselves just to kind of carry on that legacy and hopefully the museum will do some something and magnificently towards that that legacy. Just to, even to the history, the, the, the Lusitania has got lots of history that's readily available online, history books and all that kind of stuff. I don't I'd claim myself to be an expert on the history of the Lusitania. There's some facts that I that I love to talk about. And sometimes when, when I'm actually going out to a wreck, a lot of divers will 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 know um, when a boat that you're in going out to the wreck is doing 25 knots, 24, 25 knots, you could cruise at 24. It's a serious feed. And it's it always strikes me when I look at the GPS and I think, Jesus, the Lusitania was able to attain this speed. A vessel of that size, like I have items from the wreck that are that weigh a lot. And when you consider, you know, 30,000 tons plus going at 25 knots, you could actually pull a line of water skiers behind the, the Lusitania. I know I, I often use that, that analogy. Um, and another one that gets me is the fact that her coal bunkers used to take about six to 7,000 tons of coal. The normal wrecks that we dive off the south coast and you know what what normal the normal shipwrecks as would have been normal transatlantic steamers of the first second world war they were only four five six thousand tons so you can imagine that every time you dive one of those that the entire ship is inside in the lusitania you know that sheer size and weight of of coal which is phenomenal Anyway, not to dwell on the history, that's quite, uh, quite um, uh, readily available. Um, you know how fast she was. She was one of the greyhounds of the seas herself and the Mauritania. Um, she was the first turbine driven. And she was, uh, because of her speed, she was the Concorde of the time. She was able to pass it across the Atlantic in less than five days. So the rich and famous would actually want to be on board her plus the businessmen of the time, um, because they could jump to Europe or jump to the States, do their business and get, get home quickly. 
But, you know, during a time of war, um, she was a big and fast target, you know what I mean? And that led to her sinking and all the other questions that go with that as into what controversially caused that second explosion and why she sunk so fast. Originally, her captain um, was Captain Dow, Daniel Dow, and a very accomplished captain. He was also captain of the Carpathia and many others. But during wartime, it is said that he, he took some sick leave, and that's why William Turner was then the, the captain of the ship. But it's often speculated, I'd say more than questioned, as to why Daniel Dow stepped stepped aside for that duration and it was suggested that he stepped aside because of the stress of war but also the stress of knowing what was being carried in, within the holes of, of the Lusitania because because she was so fast she was able to transport the vital war munitions um, quickly very quickly across the Atlantic whereas it, it would take the normal steamers a lot a lot longer to transport that that vital um, ammunition to, to the front. So then you'd wonder why, you know, subsequent events as into why Captain Turner's secret orders, they were never disclosed. But that's, that's all part of history. Um, her controversial actions, uh, these are some of the things I suppose that we'll never know. They're part of those captain's orders. You know, the, the four point bearing that she came so close. Normally, the Lusitania would be 60 miles offshore. When she was sunk, she was 12. Why wasn't she zigzagging? The zigzagging actually didn't, it was an idea. It wasn't brought into actual use until later that year. And I suppose the, the torpedoing of the Lusitania enforced that and then they did. Why did he reduce his speed down to 18 knots? He says, you know, to, to get to Liverpool uh, for high water and not to be a sitting duck outside Liverpool. Uh, there was other vessels that got um, a naval escort earlier um, in the war, but yet the Lusitania didn't. But yet there was no point in giving the Lusitania naval escort because the Lusitania was too fast and she'd out, actually outrun her escort. So they decided that Lusitania is probably better off on her own. So uh, she could have been diverted to the north, but apparently uh, that was denied her. But yes, if, if Captain Turner had orders, would he have actually requested to go to, go to the north? Um, it was in the subsequent tribunals that uh, the captain's secret orders, they were never, they were never revealed. I taught one year, I actually found the captain safe on the bridge, but it only had uh, three sides to it. So everything that was in the safe was lost. Um, a lot of her, a lot of even to this day, there's, there's actually um, um, a, a radio transcript between the captain and and somebody on shore that was never never disclosed, is, along with you know her public records in Kew, a lot of the file is missing. I've actually been to Kew in London to to see and look at those files, but a lot of the files are missing. Why is all that, and why was a, a passenger liner carrying explosive material? You know, these are all the questions that kind of some are answered, some can't be answered, some probably will never be answered. Um, we all know it was uh, Walter Schweiger in U20 that was responsible. I, I was involved with another wreck off the south coast of Ireland. Um, it's called the Yard. It was famous for gun running in, in 1916 after the Lusitania sinking. But it was strange that um, Raymond Weisbeck, who was the torpedo officer on U20, was the captain of U19 that brought Roger Casement into Ireland. And to commemorate that 50, 50 years later in 1966, Raymond Weisbach actually came to Ireland and he was questioned about his involvement in the sinking of the Lusitania. And he, he spoke about it, um, but his son, the, the guy who was writing the book on, on the odds that we were diving on and, and doing the story on, 
he told me that um, Raymond Weisbeck had married much later in life to a much younger woman. And, and back in 2015, that his second wife was actually still alive in a nursing home. But they had a son who was here in 1966, and he is Professor Christian Weisbeck. And I spoke to him at length about his father's account of the sinking of the Lusitania. And he told me that his father's account was that basically they knew that the Lusitania was going to be carrying the missions and that they were told to go and sit and wait off the south coast of Ireland, that the Lusitania would slow down, come a little closer to shore and make it a sit and duck. Now, I couldn't discount that, whether it's true or not or false, but it's still, I, I like that story. This is where the kind of controversy begins. Um, if you were ever, I'm sure a lot of you and most of you have been on a car ferry in your days. And if you could imagine a ship, 15, 20, 30,000 tons, you know, disappearing in 18 minutes, it's kind of unheard of, phenomenal. Or to think of that, that ship that you're on is, would just disappear beneath the surface. As, as divers, you know, it, it might take you some days, 15 or 20 minutes to put on your gear just to get in the water, but yet that ship could go in less than in, in 18 minutes. It's just unfathomable. But anyway, for what she was carrying, you know, the three or trees, they said, yeah, that she was allowed to carry, carry those small arms, um, shrapnel cases. I've seen those. The detonator fuse caps, they were, in, they were recovered in 82. The aluminium dust powder, gun cotton. We, during um, National Geographic gig, we put a, an ROV deep inside and we think we saw what was, but we couldn't get a sample of gun cotton. Um, as regards, you know, a crime scene investigation, you look at that direct site to look at the damaged area where the torpedo first struck, then you have the second explosion then you have her striking the sea floor. Then the, the bow is not in line with the body of the ship where it twisted and contorted as she struck the sea floor and there was 20,000 tons behind her pushing and that concertina effect into the sea floor. And then you have 100 years, 105 years of decay and rust and storms and all that. Will we ever know? For, you know, to carry out an investigation on the area. And my theory on it, as I say there for what it's worth, if whatever caused the second explosion has now gone up in that explosion, so we're not going to find a trace of what that was. If we do find live explosives on the wreck, we can say, yes, she was carrying explosives, but we can't say that that was the explosive that actually caused the second explosion because it's there, it's, it's still an explosive. But that's something that, you know, it's, uh, it was always in Greg's, in one of his foremost, he wanted to find out what caused that second explosion. And that's kind of the mantle that has been passed on. To go back a, a small bit about, you know, the recent dives on the wreck, um, Polly Tapson and an English team they dived this in around the, the mid mid nineties, and um, at the time they didn't have Greg's permission. And because of that, um, uh, uh, let's say a story was fabricated about seeing the lead tubes. And Michael D. Higgins, who was our our current president at the time, he was the environmental officer, and he was more interested in the Hugh Lane priceless artwork that was reputedly on the wreck. And he thought it was just as easy for some diver to go out after their Sunday dinner and have a dive and collect a Monet or a Rubens off the wreck. So that's why a heritage order was placed on the wreck. And it was since then, since like 95, 96 is when all the court litigation between Greg and the state happened and there was lots of incidents around, you know, recoveries from the wreck at that time, be it, as, as mentioned there, the rivet recovery and the chamber pop that was taken up. And it kind of sets the precedence as to how recoveries would go forward. And again, 
I was involved with the recovery of the 303 rounds in, in 2008. But since then, things have been difficult between the state officials and Greg. But they've got easier over time. They have been, they were in locked horns. And, you know, after the court battle, there were sore wounds that had to be licked for a while until, until things got a little bit easier. But they eventually did, I'm, I'm happy to say. Some of the previous big dives um, in the 1930s, Jim Jarrett dived that he had a kind of an atmosphere suit on. And the way he identified the wreck was, was primarily by one of the rivets. It was a two inch rivet that, that were on the hull plating of the Lusitania. And that was the closest thing that he saw. And because it was a two inch rivet, he claimed it was, he was on the Lusitania. He did, there was claims that she was, he claimed that she was on her port side but she's actually on her starboard side. Uh, so you could imagine, you know, diving in. There was a, an earlier a, an earlier attempt where they tried to build a tube that led from the surface straight down to the wreck, but that didn't work out. Later, you know, there was the British Navy in the 50s, apparently, or supposedly, uh, John Light did a lot of dives on it, I think over 40 on air much to the amusement of the Kinsale locals at the time. Um, Paddy O'Sullivan always keeps me up to date on them. Um, oceaneering, that's when she was heavily salvaged and kind of, Greg got in, got a little bit of bother over the involvement of oceaneering. He was kind of branded as if he was profit, profiteering from the sale of those, but it, Greg didn't actually get any. He got he got six of the large, large Kitchener spoons um, from that uh, commercial salvage operation. What the what oceaneering got when they whatever they recovered, they sold, and that's what paid for the expedition. But it wasn't until they brought those items back into Liverpool is when uh, the Queen of England decided that she'd take on Greg for the rights and the ownership of those items that were landed on, on British soil that led to another court case that Greg had to get involved in, which he, he won his rights. So he had to he had to undergo three court cases or three countries and three um, ownership cases in different countries. And won his case on, on, on those three different occasions. Um, since I got involved, uh, I've had, you know, some great times um, between National Geographic and the, the artifact recoveries. The National Geographic one, it kind of, it, it went, the planning was all there, let's say. Um, we were, I was working with the producers um, that were based in Hollywood, um, which sounds all kind of up there, but they were very down to down to earth guys, and then I got an email one night saying that um, that the ship was booked, and I kind of went right, okay. When when is it booked for? And they told me the date, and when I looked at it, they had booked a solid week of spring tides, which is not a good thing on the Lusitania, where you where you get blown off it. So the contract date had to stick with that. So it, we didn't get the results that we actually wanted to because of the tides, you know, you try, you try and fight with mother nature out there, you will lose. Um, but it was a, it was a great experience, a great time. Um, we, we, we tried to cut a hole for, you know, to put a, put um, a small ROV down into the, the opposite side where the torpedo struck. But with myself and Greg, uh, we, we joked about it for a long time after. What we ended up doing was we, we tattooed the Lusitania with a set of Olympic rings because the, the actual cutter would never cut in a complete circle and it would go off on the, final, on the final cut and then overlap itself and then overlap itself. So it didn't actually work out. Just after... Um, that National Geographic um, big dive, we had a lot of the paperwork in place. We had a lot of, uh, what would you say, the right things, the right people in the right place. 
to continue. And uh, like, even though National Geographic was going home and the, the production company, and we were all still local divers. We still had a green light from the state. We had archeologists, conservationists to actually carry out a recovery. So we went out with two small boats. That one, the, the Roan Corrig, which you see there, that's, that blue boat in the foreground was a work vessel that's owned by Gavin, uh, Gavin Tidey, who owns the Sea Hunter that Joe and, and his crew will be on um, later in the year. We recovered quite a bit on that day and it was, it kind of set a benchmark as into what could be accomplished by a small team as opposed to paying millions um, in the week and a half prior to that with National Geographic, we had ships, the whole lot. But because the production company had a different agenda, they wanted money shots of the wreck and all that kind of stuff that they didn't, they didn't get. And it was more so a forensic evaluation on the wreck and all that kind of stuff. But since then, you know, we've, we've come a long way. We've, um, and even hopefully there's lots more teams getting involved and hopefully future recoveries are going to take place. These are just some of the dives that I was, that I've been involved in down through the years. Um, they speak, they tell a story of themselves. You know, some of the recoveries, I've had some great times. I've had some horrific times too, where I lost the telegraph. Yeah, my hands up and, um, those of you will know that um, when you set up, when you when you use lift bags for years and years and years, you're bound to have a failure every now and again. But I've had, but I had to do it in style. I did it on the Lusitania. But thankfully, the loot that telegraph was was relocated. It had landed practically straight back down where where it was taken up from. But still, you know, it was a story in itself, um, one that I'll never forget. <laughs> I remember the other divers that were on the on the on that trip. They came down and towed me in the water while I was decompressing that it was lost, so that I wouldn't flip the lid once I got back up on deck. So they knew it was safer to tell me while I was in the water than to tell me while I was on deck. Um, if any of you are ever thinking of diving the Lusitania, don't be don't be a bit phased. Once upon a time, it used to be a, an onerous task. But it's not that bad now once you have the correct qualifications, a bit of experience. Uh, as I said, um, told the guys, Greg, I think he holds the, the title for the deepest or the oldest technical diver uh, ever. You know, at 76 to dive the wreck on open circuit, I think uh, that's quite an achievement. So. For all my, my, my friends in the museum, Con and all them, now the, the challenge is up for them now as the new owners that they can learn how to dive. Um, the permission from the, the new wreck owners, as in the, the museum, is, is required um, a license from the state because it's uh, now an, an archaeological and has been since 1995, since the heritage order was placed on it. It's a historical and, and archaeological site. And, you know, once you get good weather and tides and all that, you couldn't get a more enjoyable dive, you know, uh, I'd highly recommend it. These are just um, some images um, of what the wreck looks like today. The center image there and the top right are by Ken Marshall, who kind of based his um, information from hours of video footage from, from the subs of um, past expeditions. The bottom right um, is from Stuart Williamson. He's a, uh, an English, um, what would I say, he's I, I, it's not, not to do him an injustice, he's a fanatic about the Lusitania in, in all the right ways. He's very knowledgeable and he is now, he's working with uh, Peter McCamley on Project 17 and they're we're doing photogrammetry and uh, photographs and video and all that. And Stuart develops, he, he bases his images on all these, on making mosaics out of that. And I know it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but he does it very well. Um, but it's difficult working with a model that's always changing because every time, in the, almost nearly every year I go back to the wreck site, it has changed somehow. Something has happened, something has gone on.
these again it's just some more of the dives um there was a picture i showed you earlier where that the, the shower as you see the middle left that was on a dive in 2015 i think that was that was the centenary dive that i did and that shower that shower that was on the bathtub would be in the first class or could have been actually the, the captain's in the captain's quarters the shower enclosure had fallen over and that had been standing upright for the previous 15 18 years that i remember but sadly on that year it has collapsed so you know like most wrecks they they're going to succumb over time and that's why things like that our items recovered from the wreck need a place like the museum to be held for so that the legacy of the Lusitania will continue. Um, getting back to that 2015, that I think out of all the dives that I've had on the Lusitania, that particular day on May the 7th, uh, 2015, will it still stands out and i don't think i'll ever i'll ever best it um it was actually early in the season and uh, i had two other divers with me mark brennan and, and frank mckenna two very good divers and just because it was early in the season mark had a technical issue frank just said no it's just too early but there was something in me because i had painstakingly written out the names of all the people that were lost in the Lusitania and we put them on a scroll on that plaque and it was just something I had to do and I didn't care whether I was going alone or not but I did I dived alone and strangely enough that week blew hard for the week but it was a Thursday and at seven minutes past two was slack tide and that was the exact time that the Lusitania was you know sinking in the in the death throes on the surface so i dived 100 years actually to the minute to the hour um of the sinking i laid the plaque on the wreck took some video and while even while i was up in the decompression stage far you know i think it was about an hour and a half i didn't do too long on the bottom because of the, the, the temperature at that time of the year but i i still i remember i can see you know the people when you look at up back up the surface of the, of the water you'd see their legs in the water imaging back to 100 years prior to that and that to me was the most poignant time and it kind of i won't say then but it, i i had a transition time on the lusitania of being a working diver being a tourist diver a working diver and then you know you kind of lose sight of and the whole wreck becomes personalized because of the amount of people that were lost on it but that by far was the most moving dive i've i've had oh and sorry could you unmute yourself okay Just bear with me now. I think my I'm frozen here. We can see. If, if you wiggle your mouse on the screen, if you in the lower left hand corner, you should see little arrows. No, not on the lower left. Hmm. This, right. this, oh, there, yeah, you see in the lower left hand corner right here. Yeah, yeah. hit that. Gotcha. Another way of doing it. Um, right. Um, because, uh, Greg, it's something that's kind of only dawned on me. Um, 
more recently, and Jennifer, you inadvertently touched that at the beginning that you know you call me a steward of the wreck. Craig commissioned, as you see in the middle of that picture, he commissioned four of those uh, four of those badges of Lusitania stewards to be made. He gave me one, he gave Khan one, one for himself and one for his son. And there's a story behind that. But I think he knew, you know, at that time what he was going to do with the wreck and who was going to look after it going forward. And he chose wisely in giving that to, to everybody, to Khan, uh, because he's seen the work that they had been doing. Um, on the wreck and all that, uh, are on uh, developing uh, the signal tower, the Napoleon, the Napoleonic signal tower, restoring that, and all of those things. So he had, you know, he had given it quite a lot of thought. He had, he had thought of donating it to many different, or three or four different uh, institutions, but it didn't work out. Not that it didn't work out. He kind of thought, no, this is the best way to go. In the last, and especially this year, there is a lot of interest in in the wreck again, as in, you know, dive groups wanting to which wanting to dive the wreck, which is great. It's kind of it brings it back into the limelight, and because of social media and all that, whatever guys and people do, it's all getting back out there, which is a which is a great thing. And the more awareness we can get on the wreck, and you know, the more notoriety that the museum gets it's it's vital at the moment because of the whole covid worldwide pandemic and all that it has put an end to the possibility of the museum actually making money you know and they only made a small bit with the cafe and stuff for what they had they were you know they needed to walk before they can run but they were getting there slowly but surely but covid then ended that so hence that's why um uh, GoFundMe has been set up and all that as uh, as a memorial place for the Lusitania, and you know, and hopefully we can get further recoveries done and all that kind of stuff. Hopefully, um, just to reiterate that the bottom right photograph there, I should have had a picture of of the signal tower before, uh, you know. Khan and all, all the guys that are putting their heads together and they restored that signal tower, which was an amazing feat. And I think when I remember back, Khan came to one of my talks many years ago and he told me and explained and I kind of thought, Jesus, uh, if these guys are away with it kind of thing are best to look. And But they put their shoulder to the wheel they walk the walk, they talk the talk, and they have done amazing work in in restoring the signal tower. Then phase two of building the memorial garden, which is phenomenal with the wave. If you ever come to Ireland, it's I call it one of Ireland's wonders. It, the wave needs to be seen, to be believed. And now it's phase three, which is of the museum itself. And I put, um, some of you may have seen the video, um, the promotional video for the GoFundMe. I have um, linked it here. It's, it's actually the next slide and I'd like you to just take a look at it because um, I, I couldn't do it justice as to what this clip can do. So just have a look at this. It was 10 minutes past two in the afternoon on the 7th of May, 1915, and the Lusitania was just 12 miles off the old head of Kinsale, within sight of land when it was torpedoed by a German U-boat. It took just 18 minutes for the ship to sink and for 1,198 passengers and crew to lose their lives. Just 18 minutes to change world history, as this attack eventually propels America into joining World War I, decisively tipping the balance against Germany. 
the Lusitania had set sail from New York just six days before, carrying 1,959 people on board. Innocent passengers looking to make the voyage across the Atlantic to Liverpool. Many rescue boats were launched from Court McSherry, Cove and Kinsale and managed to save 761 people. However, for the others, the Old Head coastline was to be their last sight. The story of that last voyage and tragedy, along with a memorial to all those lost in the attack, is to be found in the Old Head signal tower, which looks out across to the very spot where the ship was sank. Renovated in 2014, the Old Head signal tower itself, over 200 years old, played its part in the Napoleonic Wars. Since it was renovated, it has received over 20,000 visitors from all over the world to witness the only signal tower open to the public. Within the grounds resides the Lusitania Museum, a memorial garden, beautifully recalling all the names of those lost at sea in an elegant and moving sculpture. But now we need your help in order for us to create a new home for the story of the Lusitania's last voyage and legacy. Having restored the Napoleonic era signal tower and established the Lusitania Memorial Garden, this local community voluntary group now intends to build a museum on this site. In appreciation of our work to date, we were gifted ownership of the wreck of Lusitania by Mr. Bemis before he died in 2020. Greg Bemis, the American entrepreneur who gained ownership of the Lusitania wreck, fully endorsed the creation of a museum at the Old Head to house its history. Lying on her starboard side in 300 feet of water, the wreck of the Lusitania is rapidly deteriorating. Hi, I'm Evelyn. My father, Greg Bemis, was thrilled to give the, his beloved Lucy to the Old Head Signal Tower Museum because he knew it was in the right hands to be protected and honored. Please give generously so the museum can be built. Sympathetic to this environment, a modern building will house the Lusitania Museum and honor the long maritime history of the wild Atlantic coast. A professional team is currently working to bring the project to fruition. Our appeal is for funding to bring the project to the ready to build stage. To donate to this appeal, please log on to the GoFundMe website and search the Old Head Lusitania Museum and Signal Tower. Thank you. I couldn't have done that any better. Um, Any of, you, any of you want to get wet? You want to go underwater and have a look? Um, this, this is not, uh, I'm not apologizing. Well, I am apologizing for the video. It's not done like with lights and big outriggers and that. It's not for, for video. This is wearing a head cam because the majority of my dives are working dives, but I'll try and talk you through this so I'll delve along the way. Kind of landing down um, across the, wreck, the bridge area. I know the like of Joe now with the feet behind now, I'm sure he's spot it's already something there. Out, but... This is just moving back along the edge of the wreck. I was heading. Um, or something that there was actually a sole of a shoe down there, which is um, makes it a bit poignant reminder to the lives of our last time. Um, 
at the time, Stephen, was that I had a license to actually recover it. Um, what we had to do in archaeological assessments on the city itself. And you know what that is? Second time over. I have, I have uh, the other one. Uh, it's out in my hallway here where it meets. My wife needs and wants to go to the museum because she's fed up a look for um, Just there is coming into view. It's one of the chimes of the triple chime steam whistle that we had to evaluate and look at and devise a way of recovering. Um, that chime that's just, just at the bottom of the light is on now, that is actually smallest of three chimes and it's a meter long. Every chime is partially buried. I couldn't find it at all. I actually did some uh, analysis of the ground area which I had to get a license for six to actually just down into the soft silt to see if I could actually or chime was. It was below the depth of what I went down to. There is also um, the back of the three chimes together. Uh, it's connected to a very large steep bracket at the base. And that's what actually held it forward. But yes, that bracket is actually as is the uh, high pressure steam pipe that fed that with. There's actually a depth charge, depth charges that are still unexploded on what I'm what I'm laying here is actually all rain rods for archaeological they're in long week. So from the outer time sector of the bracket. I know from researching the whistle from her sister ship, Mauritania, self weight that's, that's it, short and sweet. Um, I hope that you enjoyed watching that. Um, these are some of the items that have been recovered um, they need a home and I would urge you or anyone just to pass it on to please donate as small as little as you can just to help Greg fulfill his dream of you know and all of our dreams to find a lasting mem memory and legacy for the RMS Lusitania um, Sorry about the glitch halfway halfway through. I hope you all heard it. I hope you all enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I'm sure you can fire them to Jen and she'll pass them on. Great. Thank you, Owen. And don't worry about the glitch. It actually um, hit just at the, the right time. So we didn't miss anything. Um, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. Um, before I turn it over to Khan, just making a quick announcement that in the last time that Owen has was talking, I just want to refresh it, we raised $1,200. So in the 40 minutes that Owen gave his presentation, we raised $1,200. Hopefully we can get a little bit more, um, but thank you to all of you who've donated. I put the, the link in the chat. Uh, all of your names are going into our hat. Here they all are. I'm going to let Joe pick a name out of this hat towards the end of the presentation. But before we get there, we there are some questions. Um, actually, you know what? I'm going to turn it over to Khan now to say a few words about the museum. Khan Hayes is a member of the Old Head, Old Head Signal Tower Committee. He is one of the four stewards of the wreck that um, Owen mentioned. And um, he's going to say a few words, and uh, then we'll take some questions for Khan or for Owen or for both of them. So I'll turn it over to you, Khan. Hello, Jennifer. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Um, thanks very much, Owen. That was absolutely, I keep learning new things from Owen all the time. 
he knows so much about the Lusitania and he's so passionate about it that uh, it's inevitable that he has something new to say all of the time about it. So uh, my name is Con Hayes. I'm from the Old Head originally, uh, not living there now, living in Blown in County Cork. And um, as it turned out, we began a project on the Old Head in 2010, which was a year before uh, Owen dived on the Lusitania in 2011. Uh, now, we had been thinking about the Lusitania because the link to the Lusitania and the Old Head goes back to, 20, to 1915. Uh, as a young guy, I was very aware of the, the, the folk tales about the Lusitania and people seeing the Lusitania sinking from the top of the Old Head. So uh, that link was there all of the time. Now, uh, I didn't pay much attention to it, I suppose, as a youngster until I retired, really. And my brother and myself started this thing together. Uh, the, uh, the Lusitania was high on our, on our agenda. And we suddenly discovered that the, the Lusitania was being dived on on a regular basis. So I, like Owen, uh, managed to make contact with Greg Bemis. I knew Greg Owen, the Lusitania. Uh, I would have gone through Owen if I knew about him, but I actually didn't know about him at that stage. But he was, I found out about him very shortly, shortly afterwards. So I got e Greg's email and I sent him the first email on the 17th of September, 2011. And I didn't expect an answer because literally we had nothing done. We were only thinking out loud to ourselves about what we might do on the old head with this old wreck of a building, which we knew was a Napoleonic, 200-year-old uh, Napoleonic's watchtower. Um, and um, we weren't even sure whose land it was built on. It, it was, all of that was a bit vague. So we had to start there trying to find out who actually owned the territory. And we discovered it was in state ownership of the OPW, the Office of Public Works in Ireland owned it, but they didn't know they owned it. We actually told them uh, and we presented them with their own deeds to tell them you own this, will you give us a lease on this ground? We'd like to restore this signal tower as uh, possibly as a Lusitania museum, as a mini Lusita Lusitania museum as a, star as a starting point. <clears throat> so it, we took it from there. And when I contacted Greg, I was very bold. I said, would you mind donating artifacts from the Lusitania to us? I had no place to put them. <laughs> I asked them straight out for, for uh, artifacts. Now I was aware that they were bringing up artifacts in the Lusitania. Now I didn't know exactly what. I knew nothing about them really at that point. And Greg came back to me within a few days to say, sounds interesting. Maybe there's something to it. But like Owen, he was definitely a little bit skeptical and not surprisingly because we had nothing done. We had no money. We were a voluntary community group uh, working in our own time. <clears throat> and um, so we set, we began serious work at that point and we set the 7th of May, 2015, which was the centenary of the Lusitania as the restoration date for the signal tower as a viewing point on the top of the old head because it's the highest point on the old head and as a mini Lusitania museum. And we literally were cleaning the place out the evening before. We managed to hit our deadline. We managed to get the funding to, we managed to get planning permission. We managed to get past all of the compliance issues because this was, uh, this was a registered building. It wasn't a bit, we thought, we even thought we mightn't be allowed to touch it, but they gave us permission to restore it. And uh, I went down to Owen. At that stage, I had got to know him. As he said, I turned up uh, at some of his meetings because I wanted to see what he had to say about the Lusitania and we got to know each other. And uh, he very kindly gave me four or five beautiful artifacts from the Lusitania, which we put on display on the centenary of the Lusitania sinking in, 2015, in, in 2015. So that's where it began. Then in, in, within the next two years, we decided the next phase was to develop the Lusitania Memorial Garden. We were very determined to create a really nice monument to the people on the Lusitania, everybody on the Lusitania, those who are lost and those who are saved. Because when there is a beautiful monument in Cove, <clears throat> and there was no names in it. And we, we, so we, uh, we started investigating that. 
and we set the 7th of May 2017 as our deadline for that. The Taney Memorial Garden is our pride and joy, and especially the, um, the monument is a 20 meter long wave which contains the names and the story of the Lusitania uh, briefly. So then, um, in the meantime, Greg had come over a few times I'd met him. I actually met him at Cork Airport and brought him down to the old head <clears throat> to see what we were doing. And I think he began to be, take us half seriously anyway, he could see that we were determined to do something. Uh, well, certainly the fact that we created two, we had two stages done, if you like, and we knew the museum would be the big, that would be the big thing if we could create a museum to hold the artifacts and tell the story properly. That uh, that was our main objective, and that still remains our objective. So <clears throat> we were, we became like, like Greg himself, a bit obsessed by the Lusitania. And uh, much to our surprise, on the 7th of May 2019, uh, Greg, came over from Santa Fe in New Mexico, because that's where he lived in New Mexico, to donate the Lusitania to us. Now we knew he was going to donate, obviously, before he came, but he came to formally sign over the Lusitania to the Old Head Signal Tower Lusitania Museum Heritage Group. So we were gobsmacked, chuffed, and every, any other word you can think of to describe our reaction, because we never expected that at all. Uh, that was never our intention at the start. We, we would have been very happy to acquire artifacts from the Lusitania to put on display as part of the story. Uh, but anyway, so we are now the owners of the Lusitania, the legal owners of the Lusitania. And Owen went into some of the background to this ownership issue. So it's no longer an issue. Uh, so we are determined to, um, to fulfill Greg's wish that the Lusitania story should not die and that the people who are on it and uh, the history of it should be told to people uh, in a suitable setting and while it's an, a historical accident that the Lusitania sunk off the old head the link is indelible and it's the ideal spot to build the museum. Now on the museum itself we are working very hard we're having a zoom meeting tomorrow actually about the design of the museum we are, we are walking through the design stages with our architects and we're making progress towards a planning application which we hope to lodge in the next two or three months and after that we'll be looking for uh, serious funding from government sources. Somebody I see there in the chat box says does the Irish government give grants? They do but it's hard work to get them. They just don't hand them out really nearly but we will be making a serious capital application to to the various government funding agencies once we have the planning permission got. But to be, to be, for them to take us seriously, we need to have planning. We, we, have, uh, we have tried to get funding. Uh, we have got funding in actual fact towards the design stage, but uh, you never get enough. But uh, there's always more required. But uh, so we're, we're, we're working hard on it. And then, like Owen said, we began, we thought, Normally we have our own fundraising efforts which are quite successful, but the COVID put a serious uh, restriction on us. So we said we'd have a go at the GoFundMe. And uh, again, just like being surprised by Greg donating the Lusitania, we were equally <laughs> gobsmacked to find a group of divers in the, in the US, based in the US willing to come on board and start helping us as well. Because I mean, that we're kind of used to that in Ireland, people doing things for nothing. But you, there's uh, not some people from a different country deciding they're going to do something for nothing for you is, is just extraordinary. So uh, we're hoping, we're delighted with, with Joe and, and Jennifer for being so generous and uh, contacting so many different people and, bringing, and helping us to bring the story of the Lusitania to so many different people and uh, for all your help. So I think that's that's about it. As I said, uh, just if you can see, I don't know whether you can see this or not. I have stacked my diaries. This is a record of what I've been doing for the past eleven years. If you can see it, wow. <laughs> that that's the story of my that's my story of the Lewis. Now it makes no sense to anybody except myself. <laughs> but that's a record of what, of the people I've contacted, all of the different agencies I've been dealing with. 
everybody I have met, there's hundreds and hundreds of people I've spoken to in relation to this project. They're all inside in those books. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Khan. There are a couple of, uh -oh. can you hear me? Oh, there are a couple of questions coming in. Um, so one question uh, coming in, Owen, can you just give for the divers on the line, uh, an overview of the dive lengths, the bottom times, the permitting process. If you're a diver who's capable of diving these depths, um, what do you have to do to dive the Lusitania? And what is it like? Uh, what, is, what is the average dive on the Lusitania like? Um, normally, um, nowadays, it's all on closed circuit rebreeders. Um, you know, you need a mod tree, um, mixed gas rebreeding. Um, that's the, the mere qualification. And I know down through the years, it's like any qualification. You can, you can be as qualified as you like, but I like to see divers with a touch of experience, you know what I mean, that are well used to wreck diving. The Lusitania is a dark and deep dive. It's the wreck being one of the biggest that's off the south coast of Ireland is well attracted to commercial fishing. So there's a lot of nets on it. But that's not to be put off to, you know, uh, to, to divers, you need, you need to get a license from the state and permission from the owners. But as regards um, diving mixes, you know what I mean? Once you're uh, coded for helium and all that kind of stuff and you can, you know, access to those. Now, I know from previous expeditions and it's why a lot of the time I toned it back. I used to run larger expeditions, but the logistics of um, going to some remote place in West Cork and, you know, having those gases, um, I'm going back now like 10, 15 years ago when it was harder, but now there is places in Kinsale that can offer the gases and the blending and uh, fills when you get back on shore and that, so it makes it an awful lot easier. Plus the boats, are much better with diver lifts and all that kind of stuff makes it all the, all the more easy. Um, I've dived I've dived the Lusitania off, you know, uh, hard boats. Off, I, I've dived out of a rib a few times. Um, you know, it's it's quite achievable, you know, but don't be put off by the paperwork that that also comes with the Lusitania. And once you know, if, if you're climbing the ladder as a diver, be it open water or nitrox or trimix or, you know, you're getting up the various stages, keep going. That's all I would say to you, keep going. If it's your dream to dive the like of the deeper wrecks to Lusitania, come to Ireland, you know, or off the south coast, even the north coast of Ireland. The north coast is probably better diving as in for clarity of waters, whereas the south coast is a little bit darker in that, but you're spoiled for choice. You're literally spoiled for choice. And, you know, it's it's a diverse playground. The north and south coast of Ireland is, is really, you know, and unfortunately, a lot of the people in Ireland don't even know that there's so many wrecks off the south coast. I often get stopped in the street saying, oh, are you the fella that dived the Titanic? And I went, uh, no, uh, it's, it's called the Lusitania. Oh, that's the one that hit the iceberg. And went, no, that was sunk in the First World War with a submarine attack. Oh, and where is that? And I, if I say Kinsale, oh, is it? So, so like, it's just, it's lack of awareness and education would be, you know, is, is first and foremost. And well, that would the dive with somebody had to pop it up saying 90 meters. And... Say that again. Sorry, somebody was off mute. I just muted them. <laughs> well, I talked to somebody. I said, yes, the wreck is in 90. It's 93 meters to the sea floor. That's what I heard about a depth question. So it is like for normal dives would be 15 to to, to a half an hour of a runtime on the bottom with anything up to two and a half, three hours in the water. There has been longer dives, you know what I mean? The run times up to five hours, depending on you know, visibility, if it's, if it's good there, you'll stay a bit longer. If it's very poor, normally, and it was always instilled to, in me as a younger diver, um, have a job in your head, do that job and get out of there. The wreck isn't going anywhere and you can get back there to, to do it again. 
but we used to always have a job in hand. So it's pointless you staying. If you stay on the bottom, you know, for an extra minute, it will rack up a, a lot of decompression for you. So just, uh, as they say, prepare to dive and, and everything will go well for you, you know, dive that plan. So there's a, a, a couple of questions coming in about the interior of the rack, but I don't know if there is much of an interior of the rack. So can you describe um, the in any parts where the, you can get into the interior or with an ROV or as a diver, or is it all pretty much broken down? Because the, the wreck, because of the way she's lying on her starboard side, a ship isn't, isn't built structurally to sit on its side. So with the forces of time and its own weight, a lot of it has collapsed. There, there, there are breaches in the forward hull um, in, in the bow area now is where a lot of my dives have taken place. There is holes on the port side and even where the ship struck the sea floor, you could actually go down, just drop down from below where the port anchor used to be and you can drop down and get back up underneath and you can literally peer into a cavern, you know, and there is other areas that you can drop into, but you wouldn't actually or couldn't drop down and head off like as if you were cave diving or penetrate the wreck. Um, you can do that in various places back along midships. There's a major split in the hull and you can penetrate and in, in amongst the boilers. Um, then on the aft section, there is quite a lot of damage around the engine room where, you know, there was oceaneering had a few propeller blasts. Uh, they blasted, they used scissor charges on the propeller shafts and, and to take the, the propellers off. So there is areas that you can get into, not that far. Um, there is another part up on the superstructure that you can drop down into a little bit. But largely no because the way the wreck is orientated and has collapsed on itself so you couldn't actually penetrate the wreck in 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 too far if you know what I mean Does that answer your question yeah I, I think so uh, yeah it seemed there were a couple of people asking sort of similar questions so if it didn't you guys you can put it in the chat um, just a quick announcement before one more question. We are at $3,700. So in the last half hour, we've raised about, like, I'm terrible at math. I think $1,600, I should get a calculator out. So if anybody hasn't donated and you're thinking about it, I'd love to see us cross over the $4,000 mark in our fundraiser um, over the next few minutes or so before we do our drawing. And we only have a couple more questions. So after the questions, we're gonna do the drawing from the hat. So if you wanna try, win the GoPro, donate now. Um, I feel like I'm running a telethon, but it's really that important. It, it really is an important museum. And I don't think anybody is on that call that doesn't recognize the historic, historic significance of this rack. Um, one question about the artifacts, who is doing the conservation of those artifacts? Who is preserving them? How are they being preserved? Can you speak a little bit about that process? Yes, um, initially, uh... The majority of the items that were recovered in 2011, they were professionally conserved by a conservationist by the name of um, Ian Panter from York University in England. And the subsequent ones, um, because, because of conservation and issues like that, what, what would happen, and it was we kind of had to reverse it where if, if we were applying for a license to recover an item, the item would have to be largely brass or bronze so that it didn't require vast amounts of conservation, more like first aid and desalination. And that's largely what the artifacts have uh, had done to them. Literally, they were just placed in water. It would be a totally different thing if the item was made of iron or, or had organic, you know, like timber composition on it, that would require immediate and a different sort of conservation. But largely the objects that we recover um, are brass, bronze in, in their construction. So they just require desalination. And a lot of the time 
some of the objects are actually better. They tell a better story by being left in the original condition that they were recovered in. By cleaning them up and, you know, we don't, you, you don't polish them and all that kind of stuff because that takes, it, it, it doesn't reveal the story. But when they're left in their original state, it, it tells the story that they've spent the last 100, 100 odd years, you know, lying on the, on the Atlantic floor. Is that okay? Yeah, we have a question for Khan, um, who wants to know if you've contacted Bob Ballard about fundraising at all. No, I haven't contacted Bob Ballard. I've contacted a lot of people, but not Bob, no. I don't have his contact details. <coughs> but if somebody gives them to me, I certainly will contact them. Um, so a question, I, I guess, for both of you, really. Um, are there artifacts on your wish list that you wish to acquire? Like if you could think of one thing that you would be desperate to find on the Lusitania or to bring up something you found and you'd like to bring up, what would it be? Uh, from, I remember Khan a few years ago, he actually asked me to recover the, the ship's rudder. And I kind of wide eye, wide eyedly opened, I kind of went, the, the rudder? I went, um, it, it was actually 56 tons in weight and I'd need a serious salvage ship to recover that. But no, uh, um, anything, I suppose every, all divers know that like the, the ultimate prize would be the ship's bell. Now the, the main mast bell was recovered in 82 by Oceaneering, um, but there's still reportedly a bridge bell but I'm leaving that job up to Joe because he found the Britannic Bell and he's got an eagle eye on him because I remember he sent me a small clip of some of the preparation work I was doing on the ship's compass that I was hoping to recover. And I, I noticed in the video that as soon as the video came up onto the image of the compass, he screamed like a lunatic through his mouthpiece that it was the compass that he was looking at. And it's rare that you see a diver or have a diver that has such a sharp eye that he knew exactly what he saw the second he saw it. So I'm letting I'm letting Joe find the, the bridge bell and we, we can we can organize a recovery a recovery license for that once he finds it. Yeah. Well I guess we could consider that a challenge accepted <laughs> for sure. Um, does anybody have any more questions? All right, I'm just going to check one more time to make sure there's no more names that need to go into this hat. Oh, one more. Thank you, Dr. Levine. All right, I'm gonna put the last name in the hat. Is anybody like donating right now where we can dance or ask one more question before I put the name in? If you wanna put it in the chat and say, I'm donating right now, give me two seconds. We're happy to wait for you. Oh, somebody just donated. Thank you, Christine. And while we're just waiting for those last few donations to come in so I can write them on my pad and put them in my hat, um, Jill Car Carlier, who is, I don't know if she's still on the call, just visited Pier 45 where Lusitania left from in Chelsea Piers and has some beautiful photos. So I'm going to put her on the spot and ask if it's okay to share those on our Facebook page because it was a really lovely little trip that she just did. Um, so I'm going to share that. She was just mentioning it in the chat. So we'll share those on our Facebook page so that you guys can see them, assuming that Jill's okay with it now that I put her on the spot. All right. Oh, we got two more in. All right. Anybody donating right now? Pat, I got you. Pat Wade. Anybody donating right now? I got you, Christine. All right, I feel like um, there's a lot of jobs going on here behind the scenes. Oh, somebody, so while, while we're waiting, oh, part of your 54, did I see people? There is one more question about the coal. Somebody is asking if you could raise money like they did, you know how like Titanic is selling coal from the wreck to people to raise money? Is that, um, 
Is that something that you've considered doing, kind of pulling up coal and chunking it up and selling it as a way to raise money so people can get their own lump of Lusitania coal? Um, that would be a novel idea, but because it's classified as an archaeological site, no. And another aspect of that, she was five days into her voyage, she hadn't much coal left in her bunkers, so there wouldn't be that much left. Now, I know from other wrecks that were called or classed as commodity wrecks, they'd often have salvage vessels operating above them, and the salvage vessels would have to have um, their bunkers loaded with coal from, from other boats, and the coal not sometimes rains down on the wreck. Um, I'm getting sidetracked now, but actually Greg had an idea because the, of the bullets that we located in 2008 and there were so many of them there, he had the idea of actually recovering a lot of the bullets and sell the bullets, um, uh, you know, as souvenir keepsakes, a lot of them, like they're all, um, you know, they, they wouldn't fire, you know, anymore, but yes. That was quickly and sadly knocked on the head as a non-runner um, by the state because of the historical importance of the wreck. So, sadly, I don't think that would be a runner in the in the state size. Yeah, that um, that would be way cooler than a lump of coal for sure. All right, Joe, you're making lots of noise. We're about to do the drawing. Oh, he's ruining everything. All right, we're gonna. He opened doors, he's pouring water, it's madness here. Okay, we're gonna do the drawing right now. Everybody's name is in the hat. If you donated $100 or more, your name is in the hat twice. You're gonna to have to trust me, but I double checked. And I'm gonna go into the other room. This is like magic. I'm gonna go into the other room to do it. Here, unmute yourself. Close the door. Shake it up. And this is for the GoPro Hero 9 Black. Yeah, you pick it. I know you pick it. It's too much pressure on me. Here, you can read it. The winner, uh, the winner is Peter, Dr. Peter Levine. Okay. Where is he? I don't know. Peter, are you here? I have everybody's email address, so anyone who donated. I have your email address through GoFundMe, so I will um, I will make sure that I connect with you, and we will make arrangements to get the GoPro out to you. So everybody, see there it is, Peter Levine, in my horrible handwriting. All right. So all together, we raised. Wait, Joe, say something. She's checking how much we raised. This was a great presentation, Owen Khan. Thank you so much for. Uh, uh, filling us in on the uh, your uh, past uh, adventures with putting the museum together and the, your future endeavors. And thanks, Joe, very much for all that you're doing. You know what I mean? It's a uh, you, 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 as they say, you run a tight ship there, and you, you and Jen, and they, they always say behind every good man there's a good woman, and now I, it's it's quite obvious in Jennifer, you know. Can yes, she is. Can I add my thanks to that on behalf of the Lusitania Museum Alt Head Signal Tower Group? Uh, it's been brilliant, really. And thanks to everybody who donated. Thank you. So the grand total is we started this presentation with just over 2,000. We raised 3,996 altogether now. So we raised $2,000 in the last hour. I'm going to add the extra four bucks to take us over 4,000. <laughs> I'll put in a donation so we'll be over 4,000. But to those of you who haven't donated yet or are thinking about donating, um, we're going to keep doing this. We're going to have some other prizes. We're going to do some things um, leading up to our expedition. Like I said, when we're at the expedition, we have set a goal at DB Tenacious and with our friends in the UK on this expedition of raising $20,210 by the end of 2021. So that's our goal. We're almost a quarter of the, uh, we're almost a quarter of the way there, right? My math again, we're almost a quarter of the way there. And hopefully um, we can continue to raise some funds for this really, really worthy cause. Um, for those of you who want to stay up to date about what's going on, both with the Lusitania and this year is the 65th anniversary of the Andrea Doria sinking. We've got a lot of stuff going on this summer. 
Um, please like us on yes. Facebook if you haven't already liked the DV Tenacious Facebook page. And we hope we'll see you soon. Um, hope we'll see you on Facebook and hopefully we'll see you live from the Lusitania in August. COVID fingers crossed. Everybody stay healthy and be well. Thank you so much for joining us. I don't know where that music came from, but it was really timely. <laughs> you guys be well. Hope to see you soon in person. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, really. We are too. We are too.